Hello everyone, it's really good to be here with you once again as we continue our journey through Zechariah, looking at these challenging visions that the Lord gave him some two and a half thousand years ago. You won't be surprised to hear me say that the Old Testament is very, very important. Christians should concentrate on it and learn a great deal from it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul, referring to the Old Testament, says it is full of typos. Now, that doesn't mean that it's full of errors. Typo meant something that was an example, a spiritual example that could be a great blessing. And in his letter to the Romans, Paul says something which is even more impressive. He says these words, everything that was written in the past, that's the Old Testament, was written to teach us so that through the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. Everything is for us. That's quite a statement, isn't it? Now, this particular vision is no exception. In it, we see this very, very graphic and very spectacular image of the fifth century high priest, Joshua, standing in disgusting and filthy robes before the throne of God, and all kinds of things happen. But what I want to say to you for this film is this, Joshua is us. Every person who confesses Jesus as their Lord and Saviour. Joshua is representative of the process of salvation that all Christians go through. And so what we're seeing in this passage is nothing less than a blow-by-blow blow account of how God saves us. What could be more important? Let's dive in and have a look at some of the exciting things this passage has to show us. First of all, be under no illusions. The beginning of this vision is absolutely horrifying. It is a frightening scene. Think of it as the climax in a movie where someone who you're very, very fond of is about to meet a grisly end. Joshua the priest is standing in filthy clothes and at his right hand side is none other than Satan himself, the accuser. And Satan has a cast iron case against poor Joshua. Joshua, we are told, is dressed in filthy clothes. In fact, the original Hebrew is very specific. To describe filth, it uses the word soy, which meant human excrement. Poor old Joshua is as filthy as you could possibly be. And this filth, this corruption, represents his sinfulness and the sinfulness of the people he represents. So Satan, the accuser, is about to accuse him. And of course, the accuser is right. All of these things are very real, horrible truths, sinful truths that are about to be brought forth. Joshua's in trouble. But God, our wonderful Lord, our Father, intervenes in a way that is timely, passionate and effective. First of all, before Satan even opens his mouth, God says, silence, stop, I won't even hear it. Don't bother opening your mouth. This isn't some kind of movie where the hero arrives just in time or maybe even a little too late. God's intervention is timely and perfect and Joshua is fully and completely rescued in time. Secondly, God's intervention is passionate. It's a wonderful, passionate response. The Lord rebuke you. A phrase repeated, of course, in Jude in the New Testament. The Lord rebuke you. It is rather like saying, leave him alone. I love him. I am passionately, absolutely for this man. And even though he is a sinner, you don't go near him. It's wonderful to see love like that shown to Joshua and wonderful to reflect that this is how God feels about you and about me. And finally, God's intervention is 
effective. Joshua is removed from this situation. God describes it in this marvelous way. He says, Joshua, you're like a burning stick pulled out of the fire. You're on fire, but you're out of the fire now and you're gonna be okay. In the King James Bible, it uses a beautiful phrase to describe this moment, the way in which the King James translates it. He says that Joshua is a brand, that means a burning stick, plucked from the burning, a brand plucked from the burning. He is totally safe, having been in unimaginable danger. And so we get this marvelous opening message about God's love for Joshua, God's love for us. It's timely, it's passionate, and it's fully and completely effective. The next thing to grasp from this amazing vision is that Joshua is clearly saved for a purpose. Now, this seems like a very, very obvious point, and indeed it is, but it is one of the most regularly forgotten points or emphases in the Christian faith. Christians often forget that they're saved for a purpose. It's helpful to just hear those verses again that give us an explanation. Now Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see I've taken away your sin and I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. So you see this twofold process of what happens after he has been saved. He is cleansed. Joshua has his sinfulness and the sins of his people taken away from him. His filthy garments are removed but he's not left like that. He is then dressed in clean garments, dressed for service. He is then given a, uh, a turban, which is, I was gonna say, a, I don't know what begins with S that goes on your head, I don't know, um, sombrero. He's not given a sombrero, he is given a turban. And that turban was famously given to Aaron the high priest and all of the priests who ministered before the Lord on behalf of the people. It is very symbolic that Joshua is being required not just to be clean, but to be clean and do something. So often it is the case that Christians accept that salvation from God, hallelujah. They accept the cleansing of the Holy Spirit moving through them. But then they kind of forget a bit about the fact that every single person who's given their life to Christ is called for a purpose. No Christian has no purpose. We all have things to do. We need to be seeking after God and asking, Lord, what do you want me to do? A great secular career, a decent pension plan, marvelous foreign holidays, all these things that are incidental. Lord, what have you called me to do? That's the big question every Christian needs to ask. We're saved with a purpose. The next thing to say is that the rewards, the benefits, the blessings of going through this process are just astounding. If you have a look at the end of verse 7 in your Bibles, you'll see that God makes it really, really clear. He says, you have a place here. We are standing in the vision in the throne room of God himself, in heaven, so to speak. And God says, you've got a place here. At least that's how the NIV translates it. The NIV, however, doesn't translate an important word that is there in the original Hebrew, Malachim. It is translated in the ESV, and you know I'm a fan of that. But Malachim is important. What it means is you can walk in. Now that's slightly different from saying, ah, oh, you have a place here which is lovely, but to say you can walk right in any time, there's something more spectacularly gracious 
and amazing about that. Let me try and explain it like this in microcosm, really in a very much smaller way. Imagine you are best friends with our Prime Minister Boris Johnson. You and he are mates and he says to you, if at any point you want my ear, if at any point you want my help, if at any point you want to come to me for wisdom and guidance, you can come straight to number 10 and walk straight into my presence and be with me. I'm there for you. No one will stop you. You can walk right in. Malakim. Now stop and think about this for an awesome thought. God says that to you through Christ Jesus. Remarkable. God says, hey, you can walk right in and see me anytime you like. What an incredible thing. You must forgive me for a moment. I'm going to go off on just a little bit of a tangent. I think it is important that we understand a bit more about just why we can come into God's presence in this way that I've just described. It's because of Jesus, of course. Now, in this vision, there are two main references to Jesus. We find Jesus and prophecies about him all the way through the Old Testament. The first I'm sure you've spotted straight away, this reference to the branch with a capital B. All the way through Isaiah, all the way through Jeremiah, we hear of the Messiah, the Christ, Jesus, spoken of as the branch. So that's a familiar one. But if you know your Old Testament well, you will also know that Jesus is referred to repeatedly as a stone, a cornerstone, a stone on which other things are built upon, a precious stone. Here's a good example taken from Peter's first letter. In 1 Peter 2, 4, Peter says, as you came to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him. So in this vision, Jesus also appears as the stone. And that stone, we are told, in a really enigmatic way, has seven eyes. That means seven facets. The number seven, when it appears in scripture, means wholeness, completeness, perfection. So what we are seeing here is a perfect stone has been set into the turban of Joshua. That's what goes ahead of him as he comes into the throne room of God. Now if you just stick with me for a moment as I explain the significance of it, this precious stone with something that we're not told what engraved upon it, that will resonate if you have studied just what Aaron's turban looked like. He had his turban on, he had a gold band around it, and that gold band supported a gold plate. And written on that gold plate was holiness unto the Lord. It was making a statement. This guy is supposed to be holy. He's supposed to be good. He's supposed to have obeyed the law. This is his right to come into God's presence because he has the law. He has this covenant agreement with God. He should have kept it and so should God's people. So he comes before the Lord with this metal plate at the front of his head. But we find, as we study the New Testament, that the law, that our own ability to follow it, was not sufficient for us to be saved. We need Jesus. We need to be accepted by God through our faith in his Son, our Lord and Saviour. We need something better. And Joshua's given it. Joshua is given this stone. It is set into his turban. And God says, you can come and see me any time. Why? Because you come with the righteousness of Jesus Christ himself. That's for Joshua and as I've said time and again, that's for every person who gives their life to Jesus. Jesus is set into your turban and you can be with God. Hallelujah. I'd like to finish these few reflections with a true story set in 1709, a long time ago. There was a preacher called Samuel Wesley, and he was famous for his very stern and really quite aggressive sermons. 
famous is one way to describe it, but rather disliked might be another way to sum it up. And one awful night in 1709, as Samuel Wesley lay sleeping in his manse with his wife and all of his children, some people from the local village came and they set light to the manse. They tried to burn it to the ground and indeed succeeded. When he was alerted to the fire, Samuel Wesley managed to get his family out of the burning building. And as he gathered them outside, he suddenly realized to his horror that his young son, John, was still in the building. John was calling for help and screaming as the beams and the ceiling started to come down, all sorts of terrible things. Poor old Samuel Wesley was so horrified, he couldn't find any way back into the building. He was convinced his son was gonna die. And so he got down on his knees and he prayed. And he said, Lord, please take him quickly to your bosom. Then something remarkable happened. Young five-year-old John Wesley took a few steps back, took a run up and just jumped out of an upper window from this burning building. He flew out and almost by accident was caught by someone who'd come up to help put out the fire. John was saved. They asked Samuel Wesley, shall we continue putting out the fire? And Samuel said, just leave it, let the building burn. He pointed at his safe family and he said, I'm rich enough. Now that little smouldering John is out and is safe. Now John Wesley, many of you will know, became one of the most famous preachers of all time. He preached dozens and dozens, thousands of sermons all around England, sometimes up to five times a day. And he was part of a big revival that took place and God used him mightily. And John Wesley would regularly tell the story of how he had been spared as a child. He would tell that story and he would quote the wonderful, wonderful King James Version of Zechariah. As he told the story, he would then lift his arms and say, am I not a brand plucked from the burning? Am I not a brand plucked from the burning? You see, John got it. He read this vision. He read about what happened to Joshua and he realized Joshua is me. Joshua is me. Brothers and sisters in Christ, Joshua is you and I, if we have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We too are brands plucked from the burning and we are called to be about God's work. The sooner we realize it, the sooner we can crack on and do the wonderful things that God calls us to do. May God bless you all very richly.